All right, so the question I was going to try to answer was when was evil created? And then I, didn't, I just had to go, this is all the different routes I was taking. And then like I thought I had a different question, I started changing it. And then I just said, oh, you know what, let me just go with what uh, I was putting together. So through my notes, this is me paraphrasing a lot of people, right? Condensing it because we stand on giants. If you're not standing on a giant, and just reading the Bible on your own and think you got it, you will at some point go astray. We have thousands of years behind us, 2,000 plus, right, of Christianity, not to mention even Old Testament writers, the Hebrews, that have looked in a lot of things. There's not one question that you're going to face today that hasn't already been answered. That's what we call perennial questions, over and over in different forms. Nothing is there that hasn't been already done under the sun. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to take this maybe in a route you didn't think I was going to go. Yeah. So what we have here is uh, eternity, right? Then you have the decree. God makes his decree. And then from here, all creation is made. All right? I'm going to talk about right now is determinism. Okay, so what most people are going to tie into is five-point Calvinism. There's three-point, there's four-point, it doesn't really matter. There's five-point Calvinists, so those are the people that talk about the extreme. God decreed and everything is just going to happen. Does that make sense? Like nothing God that happens, God did not decree. That's the kind of the mindset. And everything you do is deterministic. It's already been determined by God. The people that really hold this is not just, you know, extreme Calvinists, but also atheists. So the atheist says the same thing. You are determined by your genetics, your environment, your social upbringing. All those things cause you to do X. It's already predetermined in you. Okay, so that's determinism. And we're going to go on this foundation because where does atheism come from? It comes from Christianity. Where does humanitarianism come from? It comes from Christianity. And that's a whole different subject, but look at it this way. From Christianity, we no longer worship the creation, right? So for like pagans, we don't go like the tree is holy. The tree can be studied. From this, you start looking at all the different things, and atheism sprouts up on it, right? And usually it came from people that wanted to get away from the implications of the morality of Christianity. Humanitarianism is, I don't want to believe in your God, but gosh, it feels so good to do such good things that Christians have done. All those things actually come from Christianity. So modern science, as we know it, Western science, comes from the ideas in Christianity, which builds up to allow them to study their environment. You can look into it, but I'm telling you, Western science is based off of uh, where Christianity springs from. Okay, so the five-point Calvinism. In Calvin, the Dutch use um, this thing called tulip. And so this one is total depravity. This one is unconditional. Election. This is a uh, limited atonement. Uh, this is irresistible grace. And then the last one is uh, perseverance. of the saints. And each one of them, they try to found it on something, right? So, uh, called uh, total depravity, men are so depraved they can't be saved, they're children of wrath. Um, unconditional election means that, you know, God elects you, right? Unconditionally, if you're chosen. Uh, limited atonement, Christ did not die for everyone, but only the five dies for the elect that he chooses. Um, irresistible grace is even if someone doesn't want salvation, God chooses them for salvation, they will be saved. The preservation of the saints means the elect will hold to God's law to the end. They endure all the way to the end, and they're faithful to the law. All right. This is considered five-point Calvin. Here, I'm going to skip a lot of things to save time. But the key thing to look at is this, like, irresistible grace, right? If... Uh, 
if God wants to save someone, they're going to be saved, whether they want it or not. That kind of ties in a little bit um, uh, to the limited atonement that God only, only, only died for the elect. These two things, especially when we look at John Calvin, who they founded it on, John Calvin said, God wants all to be saved and come to knowledge of truth. He was relying on scripture. John Calvin himself could not fit this criteria. So when you're talking about someone that's talking about so much predetermined things, John Calvin didn't hold to this, right? So it's not that God only dies for the elect. God died for everybody. Um, and so when, when they're going to rely and talk about this as Calvinistic, but Calvin doesn't go this way. So th there's already an issue if you want to take this far extreme. Um, so how do we know God died for everybody? John 3.16, Romans chapters 5-6, 2 Corinthians 5.4, right? We, we know God dies for who? He died for everybody. Because it tells us pretty straightforward. Now this is what it says, Jesus loved the world, right? Because he died for it. But if you want a description of the world, go to John 2.13. It's not very nice description at all. But that's what God loves, is where we are at the time, and not that we can make ourselves better before he comes for us, right? Okay, so when you get saved, you know that he meets you where you're at. All right. Um, so irresistible grace, God wants all to be saved, come to the knowledge of truth. 1 Timothy 2.4. Uh, God is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, that all should come to repentance. 2 Peter 3.9. God wants to save you, but you are not willing. Matthew 23.37. So a loving God does not force anyone against them, their free choice for salvation, right? He doesn't force anybody. Because if he would force his love upon you, that would be called rape. That's not called love, right? Okay, so listen, understand that. In C.S. Lewis in The Great Divorce, he wrote about heaven and hell that a person says to God, Thy will be done, O God. And God says to the other people, Thy will be done, O man. So we can find in Scripture that God releases those who are debased. At some point, he's going to say, oh, okay. So he will release you to do what you want to do. Even though that goes counter against God, it's because why? Because you have chosen to reject them. C.S. Lewis, Lewis also writes, the gates of hell are locked from the inside. God does not send you to hell. He's, you ultimately send yourself there and you've held yourself there. So when you look at conceptions of, of uh, when it talks in the Bible that when those that go down to hell, there will be weeping of gnashing of teeth, right? The weeping and gnashing of teeth is not regret in the Hebrew understanding of the context. It's you're pissed off. You're so mad, you're clenching your teeth and you're crying and you're doing this. You're sticking your fist up to God. That's what the, the proper context of interpretation should be. Not, oh, I'm in hell, I regret it. No. If you're... If you're already rebelling against God, because God's kingdom is here, you are not going to be happy to go up there to be with God, and then you've got to obey God. You're already in rebellion. Honestly, if you are rebelling at this stage, and you, you pass away, you are not going to be heavy going, ha happy going up there. Because you don't think you're going to be sitting on a cloud, stringing a harp, and playing music constantly. There's things to do, right? Because Jesus is at the right hand of God, governing the universe right now, and we are part of that kingdom. We should be helping him govern the universe. There's work to be done. I don't think that people understand that it's just, you know, running around and playing. Think about when the end times, when he comes again, there's a new heaven and earth. There's a lot to do. I want to play Star Trek, man. I want to go explore the universe, whatever it looks like, if it's possible, right? But you're not going to be sitting idle. Because that you should know, scripturally, we've never been made to be idle. We're made to be working, doing something. So it's going to be exciting, right? It's going to be like, Something we're never going to know, but we're going to be constantly doing something. That's why it's going to be like so cool. Um, okay, so let's see. Free will must take place. Uh, the, God, the grace of God can be resisted, and many times you will always resist. And that comes from Acts chapter 3 and Acts 7.51. So this is a quick rundown on determinism. When people talk about Calvinism... Calvin doesn't subscribe to it. Why is that pushed forward? Because people like to be, and I didn't go through all the points, but one of the last ones, preservation of saints, it's work-based. 
there, there's that, that's the problem, right? So we have exegesis, we look at the scripture, and the scripture speaks to us in its context and what it's trying to tell us. And then we have eisegesis, which is, I'm going to overlay my own opinions into scripture. Now the problem with a lot of thinkers is you take they take philosophy and lay that on scripture to make it match, rather than, you know, what is scripture telling us? Scripture will offend everybody. If you think God is perfectly aligned with you, you just made an, an, an idol image of God in your in yourself. Nobody will match what God has completely because He's God, and we don't know better, and we're sinful. You know what I'm saying? So we're never going to be totally go. Everything in Scripture matches. If it is, you just deceive yourself. So you got to be careful because pulling one scripture out to make it uh, a doctrine is, is really bad. Um, so you need systematic theology. If it's one part of the Bible, you need to find it in another part of the Bible. It has to be supported. Well, I won't get into this other technical <laughs> things. Okay, so in here, this is where it used to all be. But then all of a sudden, this new portion comes into play. And this portion is... Uh, Molinism or middle knowledge? What's the first word? Uh, Molinism. It's a guy named Molin or something like that, but it's Molinism. If you look at middle knowledge, you get the same thing. And the big champion of this is William Lane Craig. The guy is like phenomenal, super brilliant, does a lot of debates for uh, against atheism and all these different things. And he subscribes to this. I, uh, this is one of the areas where I'm like, I don't think I agree with it. but. I'm going to let you decide because I'm going to give you the things that uh, I filter through to, to what he had to say. So what is middle knowledge? Um, God knows what anyone's going to choose in any situation before the decree, before creation begins. And this will include the subjective conditional or, or counterfactual type thing, which is, if I had known, then I would, right? That's a total possibility it didn't happen. But if I had done this, I would have done this. And, and Craig is going, God even knows that. And I, I agree with that. Uh, but they only have one scriptural support for that. And that is in 2 Corinthians 2.8. If they had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. That's what Paul had wrote. So he uses that as a support, but it's kind of weak because it doesn't show up anywhere else. That, that systematic, systematic theology thing is, is what like, I'm talking about, right? So because it's not really voiced anywhere else, I already question, question it. Um, it's a, he uses it as a way to reconcile the sovereign uh, sovereignty of God and a human free will. He's trying to make it match, right? To make it make sense. Like I, like I said, the guy's brilliant, so I can't just discount it. Um, but that's what he's trying to do. And uh, why did God create the world as he did, where some people are saved, some people are not? Well, uh, Maybe he did it for like the greatest number that will be saved, or the greatest amount of good to be done. We don't really know. All right. So uh, Craig also says God must work with the hand he has dealt with. The counterfactuals or free creatures are outside of God's control. I don't actually totally disagree with that either. Though it sounds kind of weird, right? Um, and then, uh, and the reason I'm I'm saying I don't hold to making it a separate thing, because I think it's already included in the classical position. On this side, you're going to have libertarian free will. A lot of people call it Arminianism, but it's about free will. And the most extreme portion of it is this. You have so much free will that when you make your choice, even God doesn't know what you're going to choose. Okay, well, I disagree with that, right? I think God's omniscient and God knows. That's why I don't subscribe to that type of extreme um, free will portion either. All right. Um, I look at that, and I look at Molinism, and I go, is it a philosophy trying to imply itself onto scripture? That's what I kind of start wondering. But when we go into the classical position, God's knowledge is per perfect of himself, of what he's doing, and of what he is, has done in the decree. He, he knows, right? And he's perfect in that. Um, anything that's not in the decree, that has never been created, that doesn't exist now, most likely, we don't know for sure, that would not have the ability to influence God's decree prior. So in Molinism, I think, I think what he's trying to say is, God knowing you will change what he does in the decree. Do you see what I'm saying? Like God knowing what you're going to choose can change how he decrees things that go forward. I'm going, you know, it's already included in here. God already knows everything, and he's in the decree. It's not this. 
I'm God looking at a movie, and then, okay, now I'm going to decree this. Because this implies something you're looking at, which, but this doesn't exist. I mean, uh, let me try to give an explanation of that. We all look at, like, uh, Back to the Future, the movie, mm -hmm. right? We, like, the space-time continuum, okay? So mm -hmm. space-time continuum is like this tube of time. And you go through time, and you can go in forward in there, and you can go backwards in there. The problem with this is, over here, over here you can say, well, this guy here who sins, that's not me. You can't be culpable. I'm not culpable for this sin, because this sin in this moment of time is committed by Wayne in that moment of time. Does, you see what I'm saying? Because there's multiple me's all of a sudden. So I, I don't agree with that. I think of it in more like a rolling ball, and this moment in time is occurring, and when it's passed, it's gone. I don't think they're ever going to be able to find a way to go backwards in time because that's not how God designed it, right? God designed time start and we go. You know what I'm saying? There is no going back. So I, I disagree with this. I think this is muddled. I think that's why the movies can't make sense and all this has conflicts. I think this is correct because it's the only thing that makes sense all the way across. Um, so we talk about uh, God doing a decree. It's going to go from here forward, but is he looking forward to make changes? I don't think so. I think God decrees his will, and I think that's what ultimately comes out. And in classic theology, for the, the classic position in there, it says natural knowledge includes all possibilities. I mean, all of them. So if, I, if that's in classical theology, why do I need Molinism? You, you see what I'm saying? Then there's actual knowledge, which is what is real, what is actually known, right? So if it's already included in here, why did he come and bring this in? I think it's because William Lane Craig is a debater. He goes around and debates. He needs to establish something that can go forward into the argument. But in reality, I think it's already included. It's already part of it. The reason is because a lot of people are jumping here and trying to do this um, little knowledge thing. And uh, the reason I also think that it doesn't get too good is Kokel says, you know, before Molina and his middle knowledge, um, it was under natural knowledge. And... Um, the Calvinism or Arminianism or these, uh, this other interpretation, it's about the individual. So I believe that is what scripture is talking about many times when it deals with that, this type of subject. It's an individual-based thing. Um, Molinism, Molinism deals with a God-elect world, not the individual. So that's why I think it's more of a philosophical position rather than a scriptural you know, interpretation. Okay. Um, okay, someone can go, any world God makes, I would never be saved. What, what then? Right? Um, well, you can never over -will, override God's will when God decrees. You can't override something like that. However, you can deny what God wants. Now, that is a kind of a surprising thing, too, right, for many people. So the first thing that we look at is, can, is there anything that can, God cannot do? The answer is yes, if you didn't already think this through. Okay? God cannot lie. Right? You see what I'm saying? We instinctively know God does not do evil. We know that. In order for God to be benevolent, he, he can't be an evil God, right? Doing one evil act makes him evil. So we know that he's not going to do evil. So knowing that God, even God can't do certain things because he self-restricted himself, right? Because he made promises that he's not going to break it and all these other things. But that's a... Is it possibly exist that God could do evil things? Does it possibly exist, but not really if you understand the nature of God. Um, so the other one we look at, do you have the ability to, not, to deny God? And we all know that's true. So that means if God wants all to be saved, we also know there are many that are not. In fact, the majority of it is not. So that means that you can actually deny God what he wants. And so basically what he wants to do is he wants to love you, and you can say no. Right? So understand um, that, yeah, we can actually deny the creator of the universe what he wants. It's kind of shocking to a lot of people, but that's my position there. So what does this tell us? Tells us It tells us that justice must come before mercy and grace. And people don't like hearing that because Christians are so on the theme of salvation. But to be holy, just, and good, God 
must and necessarily follow his rule of law for him to be a uh, holy God, right? He has to hold that law. That law has to be implemented. That law falls upon us. He has to be just in it. So that means, you know, there's no cutting favors. I mean, he even writes in scripture, don't do favoritism or anything like that. And in order to be good, right, he has to hold to those laws, that rule of law type of mind process. So that's for God to be God. But then mercy and grace sets in. That's God's love applied out. And for all the violation of the law that, that is there, and he has that, that God love for us, agape, he still has to pay the price. So what I'm saying is your sin isn't free. If your grace isn't part of you for free. Someone has to pay that price. And, and if you don't have a good grasp on your sin, then look at what Scripture tells us, right? I, I believe it's in the Old Testament where it says the most righteous man um, is but uh, uh, dirty rags before God, his most righteous deeds. But in the correct Hebrew translation coming out in context, it's the most righteous man is but dirty menstrual rags before God. That, that's how his deeds are. So when you think about giving glory to God and all these things, <coughs> glory to God, you can't make him more glorious. That's just not possible. Um, take glory and put reveal. And you'll really understand what scripture is telling you. Is give all glory to God because you're going to go give everything to reveal God to others in, in their surrounding. That will help you uh, when you see the glory idea. Uh, okay, so unconditional love is shown by God when Jesus died for everybody. He died for everybody, not just the elect, everyone, right? So it's unconditional because there is no condition placed on it. However, the forgiveness is not unconditional. It is conditional. We know that Bible says there's one unforgivable sin. Hope you all have studied that much. I, I believe you have. And the other thing is we must repent to receive that forgiveness. Why? Because it falls first back on that portion of justice, right? Nothing that is sinful or anything like that can stand before God. So you need the forgiveness so Christ's blood can cover you, right? There's a active, which is his death dying for your sin, and then there's a passive, which means his whole life he did not sin. Those things will justify you, right? One is the act of faith in his death, and the other one is to justify you that he is truly sinless. Um, so forgiveness is not about God at that point, because God is hard to die for you. The forgiveness is really, do you want to take it on yourself, or are you going to go and, and let God take it for you? Um, Everything is in God's knowledge. So if people go, if a leaf falls, does God know it? And if God knows this, uh, did God make the leaf fall? I know that sounds strange, but you know that's what people think. Someone tripped. Oh, yeah, that was predestination trip, right? Um, you hear, I've heard these things. Okay, so if God makes the leaf fall, it implies the leaf had to be decreed to fall exactly at that time. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay. If God, if God does not decree his wants to be fulfilled, right? He's denying the de that to decree that. He doesn't decree it for his selfish reason that what my own wants will be fulfilled. You see what I'm saying? With, you know, he didn't go, I'm going to only fulfill my wishes, so this all my wants will be fulfilled. He didn't do that. He did not decree that. We know because we can deny what God wants. And... Um, uh, what he does decree, though, is his will. So when, God, when man fell, right right in the beginning, he already knew he was going to have to fix us. Do you see what I'm saying? So he does decree the incarnation of Christ and for our salvation, things like that. So there are things that are decreed to happen. Um, so if God decrees, could he not say, I decree that all people will have free will choice to choose? Now, if he decrees that, it does not mean that God has told you that you will decree this way. It just means that he's given it to you. But it doesn't mean that he doesn't know what you're going to choose. Alright. So look at it this way. God did not decree you to sin because you're not a robot. Right? He's not going to tell you to do micromanage things like that. Uh, and you're responsible. You're sin, not God. Okay, so what is that conclusion from that portion? God allows us to make a free will choice, and he creates the possibility of evil. All right, so God is not the author of evil. 
uh, but he makes it possible. So once he gives you the free will choice, he gave you the ability to choose to do evil. So that also opens the possibility of evil. Okay, so before man, there were angels. God created one of the most powerful beings for good, called named Lucifer as an archangel, bearer of light, right? And Lucifer wanted to be God, and therefore he became one of the most powerful forces for evil. Right? Total rebellion. He made the choice, and that's what he did. Um, no one pushed him into that, but he had the ability to choose. The difference between angels are they were what made holy right away, clean. The only thing in our case was Adam and Eve had that, right? And then they fell. So now we have this sinful nature that comes out from this, and you're looking at us, and even angels, I'm sure, are going, well, they're already starting from the bad spot, right? They're already starting with a sinful nature. So when it talks about like are we that we sit in judgment of angels, why is that? Because we come from a sinful position, knowing looking at it and then choosing right. They come from a purely, I'm already holy and I chose to switch sides. There's a difference in there. Um, okay, so let me try this again. What is opposite of God? There's no opposite of God. What is opposite of Satan? Michael, Archangel. So when they fought over the body of Moses, right? God doesn't go down there and fight with them. Michael goes down and fight with them. Why? Because Michael's an arch Archangel. What is Satan? A, a former Archangel of God. They are both created beings under God. Nothing matches God. And we try to, we tend to get into this thing, because there is a, a, an issue there. Mm. But they never equate anything to the other side. I'm telling you, God is the most powerful being ever, and he's got your back. That's what, you know what I mean? That's the thing to take out of that. Um, okay, so Adam and Eve in the garden, here's the thing. Did they need to eat the fruit? No. Why? Because evil already existed in the world, right? Satan was already there. So with the, the name of the tree is, is naming the tree, the location. There's only one tree of this kind that bears this fruit. It is a tree uh, of the knowledge of good and evil. So instead of attributing magic to this fruit, attribute that this is the location of, of where that's going to happen. So they go there. Eve takes this, this fruit, and Satan lies to her. And she took it because she wanted to be able to dictate right or wrong. She wanted to be able to, to be God. That's why. But she already encountered evil. So here's the thing. When you have uh, darkness is the absence of light, cold is the absence of heat. That's what science tells us. What is evil is the absence of good. So good itself can stand on its own. You don't need to know evil to know good. Really, you don't. Everybody knows something good that's happening to them. But, but when evil comes around, you can only know that evil because you're comparing it to the standard of good. So that's, that's what we kind of learned from there. All right, um, so when was evil created? That was the question I, we started with, right? It was created when the first free will moral creature chose to sin. Right? As soon as God gave free moral choice, and we only think about ourselves, I'm telling you, it applies to angels too. That is when the possibility for evil comes into play. And when you choose, they chose to do evil, that's, boom, that's where evil had come about. And, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if Satan was the first one. Um, evil actually is an evidence for God. That was something I, I stripped down from Coco with four observations on the final verdict. I'm not going to go into that. Instead, I'm going to jump over here. And in a, in a super nutshell, I tried to condense what he had. But in a super nutshell is because uh, there is evil, you have to have a standard that you can say it's evil. Right? Like, so if you're a relativist, like everybody makes their own moral choices and everybody's own truth is their own truth. There is no good and bad. Well, then how do you say anything's bad or evil? How do you make that declaration of evil unless it's an understanding there's a standard of evil? Where does the standard come from? And this is the thing that everybody... They're, they have a certain thing uh, called incumbency, which is the oughtness, right? You ought to do this. You ought not to do that. Everybody has that. 
what is this? It's a moral code, code that's inside of us, right? And that moral code has the force of authority behind it somewhere. So for example, if someone says, hey, don't walk over there, do you care? Maybe, maybe not. But if it's a guy with a badge on his shirt and it says, you know, go wear PD, he says, hey, don't walk over there, you're going, huh? You can attribute there's some authority behind the words, right? It makes you have to hesitate. That's the oughtness. Before you do good and bad things, you know, you, you're going to be like, oh, I ought to do something about this, or I ought not to do that. But there's a force implied there. And once you have that moral condition, it only works as like a command, right? That's implied on you. But for a command, there's two mindsets there, one giving the command, one taking the command. So all, the only thing that really matches up is there is a God, evil, just if, if you say there's any evil, then where's your standard? And you're going to come down to this, that ultimately the standard has to be something outside us. Why is that? Because morals are something beyond the, un, un, it's the unseen, it's beyond the seen world, it's beyond materialism. There is no natural part of this, natural causes, right? There's no naturalism. It doesn't happen by chance. So from that, um, morals, um, it, ha it, it has substance like this. Love, friendship, logic, math, it's unseen things. Now, if you claim a natural position, right, that it happened by chance, but right here, I hear that people talk about evolution all that. This is the problem with it. Science, while it says one thing, and we know that morals exist, right, that it's true, therefore there's other disciplines that can tell us truth. But science specific, science cannot prove logic or math. It cannot. Why can it not do it? Because it's circular for science. To prove math, you must use math. To prove logic, you must use logic. Do you see, do you see the problem with that, right? It's not tangible, it's not physical, it's an unseen world, and it's real. And we know it's true, just like love, friendships, that kind of stuff. It's true, it's, you can't see it. Right? So that, that's what we do. So the thing I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do is I'm going to have these questions. Did God create evil? No. Right? So when if someone points that out to you, you already know the answer is no. But what did God create then? If he didn't create evil? It's else. Possible. Yeah. The options to choose. And then people start arguing with you, like, how could it, you know, did God do this and that? Now this is where that objection comes from. Um, if God is omnipotent, all powerful, omniscient, all knowing, and holy, good, omnibenevolent, whence evil? How can it be evil? Or where does evil come from? If God wills to prevent evil but cannot, that he is not omnipotent. If he can prevent evil but does not, he is not good. In either case, he is not God. And that's written by David Hume. David Hume is paraphrasing the Greek philosopher Epicurus. Epicurus was born in February 341 BC in Samos, Greece, and died in 270 BC in Athens, Greece. Athens, Greece. Like I said, it's a question that's perennial, right? And Epicurus wrote, is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Then he is not omnipotent. He is able but not willing, then he is malevolent. He is both able and willing, thence whence come evil. Is he neither able nor willing, then why call him God? I'm going to break these down and restate these questions out of there to you that people are going to throw at you. Does God will to prevent evil? Yes. To prevent, hmm? to prevent evil? Mm -hmm. Does he will it? Because that's the words they're using. Is it his will to prevent evil? No. Because right? remember, remember I said the decree, what did he decree? God's will is decree. Mm -hmm. Now, so understanding that, does he will to prevent evil? No. No. Why? I'll give you a hint, because he made evil possible, right? But why did he make evil possible? For us to have a choice. Yeah. To have that choice. And what's the key about the choice? Without that choice, you can never understand true love of God. You can't unless you have that choice. Okay. If God can prevent evil, but he doesn't, is he not a good God? Because he didn't prevent evil. Does that make God not good all of a sudden? Okay, the problem is you like instinctively know God is good, right? Okay, so... How do we look at this? The guy turns around and he takes this little girl, rapes her and kills her. Terrible. The question someone's going to throw is, well, why did God allow that? That's this question right here. Well, God allowed it because he has a free will choice. 
if God did not allow you to do your free will choice, you don't have free will. Right? You are now within a structured framework. So when someone chooses to do evil, that is their choice. If someone doesn't believe or doesn't want to believe, they have chosen not to believe. That's their choice. All these things are, are your free will choice. So, but does that make God evil? No, because actually he is loving, right? He died for that person and everything. The image of God still rests in that person. So, because he's not preventing evil doesn't mean he's not good. Because we also ultimately know, in the end, everything will be fixed by God, right? So everyone that dies, you know, because we have that, remember that, that oughtness? There ought to be punishment for people who do wrong. There ought to be, you know, retribution for those that harm little kids. We, we know that. There should be. So why is that inside you? Why is that morals in you? Um, so in a relativistic position, I always say to this to someone that says it's all relative, your, your morals. I go, oh, really? So if I come up with examples that contradict that, would that, would that work for you? And then you, they know it's coming, they start skirting a lot of them. Others are like, yeah, go ahead, give it to me. I go, okay, well, murder, murder of an innocent person without justification is never wrong in any time or culture. Uh, rape. Well, Genghis Khan. Well, did you ask anybody that got raped by Genghis Khan if that was okay? Do you see what I'm saying, right? A relativist holds their position until you attack something they value. Is ever torturing a two-year-old by pulling its fingers off for pliers for your amusement, is that ever okay? Mm -hmm. The answer is no. I mean, in, no matter what culture or time you're going to have, these things are going to hold. And anytime you got a relativist, find out what's really important to them. If they're a total environmentalist, go, oh yeah, well, then we should go up into the lake and throw like, you know, bombs in the water and, and, and pollution and, and bring the fish up so we can get some easy catch or something like that. They're gonna be like, what? You know? They're gonna say that's evil and wrong. Do you see what I'm saying? They're gonna have something that, that they value. It's gonna it's gonna show they have to use a standard code somehow. Okay, if God knows evil, when evil will be done, why would he then allow it? Evil is going to be done. Why would he allow it? We have a choice. Yeah, because we have a choice, right? But what I did, I just answered those things that people have put before you. God is omnibenevolent, is omnipowerful. Why? You see, you see what I'm saying? So, I hope to answer the question of where does evil come from. It comes from everyone that commits sin and it's going to become evil, right? It's always the path of that. Um, can it be fixed? Yeah. But you, only God can fix it, so we got to go to God. And the other one, which was, you know, the question of moral dilemma, is this is, I'm asking you the exact moral dilemma questions. You might get in a different format you're going to get. So here's another one that isn't covered in this thing. Can an omnipotent God create a stone he cannot lift? Oh, that. We've heard that one, right? Yeah. Can, God, well, can, God, can God make a stone he can't lift? Well, if he, if he can, then obviously he's not God. He can't lift a stone. Oh, and then also because, you know, he can't do that, then, you know. Eliminating his powers. Right. Okay, so what's wrong with this question? It's apples and oranges. So I'm going to rephrase this question to you. Can you show me a married bachelor? Can you show me a round square? It's nonsensical. This is nonsensical because this has nothing to do with spirituality, right? Mm -hmm. It's a physical world. If, if, if they want to imply this thing, I go, well, when God got incarnated, I guess God, you know, the Father could have made a stone, Jesus couldn't lift. But that's just silliness. I mean, this, this is a silly mm -hmm. question. When someone throws that at you, you go, oh, really? Well, I guess he could or couldn't, but can you answer whether or not there's a married bachelor? Or how about a round circle? I mean, a round square, right? I mean, you ask these things back and go, well, that's what you're asking me. That thing doesn't match what you're asking me at all. Right? Okay, so don't, don't try to let them throw you too far off. Um, sorry for being <laughs> No, it's okay. Right. It was, okay. it was worth it. Was now, was there any, any questions? And I know I went through this, and you're going, why am I going through this? Because this is also going to help, help you answer these questions, but it gives you the framework of, you know, 
But where, where does the evil come from? Hopefully that, hopefully that helps you too. Maybe, it, maybe I was like totally on the wrong track with this and I should have answered it like in a normal apologetic fashion, but I thought that this was, um, I thought this might be helpful somehow. I don't know why, I just thought it might. Uh, okay, so is there any questions? You want to pray for us? We're, we have another service at right now at 11. You're welcome oh, to stay awesome. if you want. Yeah, that's awesome.